What's up, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Straight Up Saints podcast presented by Boot Crew Media and Level Water. Level Water is a New Orleans-based bottled water company providing a sustainable, reliable brand of water that relates to this generation and its ever-growing health-conscious lifestyles. Make sure to go check them out at levelwaterco.com or on Instagram at levelwaterco. Now, joining me for this edition of the Straight Up Saints podcast is Amy Just, who covers the Saints for the times Picayune, New Orleans advocate, and does work for the Association of Women in Sports Media. First off, Amy, how are you? And thank you for joining the show. I'm good. I'm good. Happy Thursday. Happy April. April Fool's, my least favorite holiday of the entire year. Um, Haven't gotten uh, caught yet on anything fake. So I'm glad you mentioned that because at work, me and my coworkers had about 20 minutes trying to figure out if this Roy Williams news for UNC was legit. Oh my God. Yeah. (laughs) The fact that it is, it's almost weird timing on Roy's part because today is not the day to drop major news, but we were sitting there going through it. And once the school announced it, we're like, okay, we're, we're ready to go and, and it's official. So I want to ask you, before we jump into Saints news, I actually want to go from the reporter side of things because we all talked about how this season was tough for players and COVID-19 presented a lot of obstacles. But as someone covering the team, what would you say is something that people didn't realize was really tough to do when you're not in the building 24-7? Yeah, so my favorite thing to do as a reporter is not just talk to the starters, but talk to the second string, third string practice squad guys and tell their stories too. Um, That's really important to me. And I couldn't do that this year because, you know, we only got three players um, on any given day and they were 99% of the time starters, you know. There were a few exceptions to that, Um, you know, if a rookie had like a good game or um, in the aftermath of the Lions game when uh, we had to talk to Michael Burton about his, you know, COVID scare. Um, And that's, that's just the way that it was this year. It's not like the Saints were like doing anything um, different than any other team because time is short and you know you only have so many minutes to do those zooms with different players and stuff and so that was the toughest thing for me one of my favorite stories that I wrote in 2019 would not have happened without the locker room um it wasn't like a great story or anything but um when they signed uh Ray Ray Armstrong um because you know some linebackers were hurt and everything Without being in the locker room, I would have never known that he and Teddy played in the high school state championship game against each other. And like, they would give each other crap in the locker room about it, like all the time. And like for the few weeks that Ray Ray was on the team and I wrote a story about it. And like that would, that would never happen without the locker room. That that doesn't happen on Zoom, nor does a, an hour long one-on-one interview with any player or even a five minute long you know one-on-one with any player it just and that's that's what's missing because our jobs as reporters is to bring fans in to the teams to where you feel like you know them as people and it is so hard to do that over zoom we all made it work um but yeah we really had to change a lot of our approaches and um and it's hard to be different when you're all on the same interviews all and everybody you know is listening to the same questions and getting the same answers and stuff and yeah that was really hard so i'm hoping that locker room access comes back this year um there were a few stories that i wanted to tell last year that i just couldn't because of because of covid and the restrictions around you know talking to some of the players who aren't you know starters or you know all pros or anything like that so hopefully cross my fingers but yeah yeah Absolutely. And you mentioned not being able to have those conversations. Well, let's say not the the household names per se. Uh, one guy who doesn't matter if it's COVID or not, he's going to you know get attention. That's Drew Brees. And now that it's all over, the dust has settled, he's gone. What's something that you say you'll miss the most? I know everyone has their favorite thing. Like I told people when he retired, the one thing I'll miss is, you know, no matter whether they're down three or up three with two minutes left, you always felt like with Drew, they had a chance to win the game. What's the one thing you'll miss most, whether it's covering him or just watching him from, let's say a fan's perspective, what's the one thing you'll miss the most about Drew Brees? Yeah, I, um, he never made any of us reporters feel like we were dumb. Like, so I know that sounds weird, but like sometimes 
you forget how to phrase your words when you're asking a question sometimes. Like, I don't know, it happens to me a lot uh, where I like zone out and like forget what I was like trying to say. Um, but he'll always give you a good answer, even if your question is crap. Um, I will miss that a lot just because we got to help each other out sometimes. <laughs> and, um, and I always liked listening to what he had to say. Okay. Most of the time I liked listening to what he had to say. Um, just because regardless of who you're talking to, when somebody has done something for so long, like their insight is really valuable and you can learn a lot from them. And I learned a lot just by listening to him and, you know, I'm not an expert. I mean, I am, but like you, you always can learn more. Right. So, and that's how I go about my job is that I will never know everything, but I want to. And so I'm constantly seeking out more and more and more. Um, and the best way for that, from my perspective is just listening to the players and the coaches that I talk to and uh, I'll miss his insight. That's for sure. Definitely. And, and you talked about just the way he was able to go with reporters. The one thing we see now from the, the new I guess I'm not gonna say the new face, but at least the newer quarterback or who we think might be the starter, Jameis Winston, I thought it was awesome was we saw a lot of emotion when he was talking about Breeze when, and you guys all opened up about it. And I've always seen Jameis, you could tell he's one of those guys, he wears his emotion on his sleeve and that's not necessarily a bad thing at all. Uh, but from your perspective, is that something you've ever seen before? And, and what do you take out of the way he described Breeze and the fact that he was so open with you guys? Yeah. Um, so I did not intend to make him get that emotional with my question. I was just genuinely curious because um, I like to hyper-focus in on one thing when I'm trying to scene set. Um, and so in the last two minutes of the game when Tampa Bay had the ball, I was just watching Breeze. That's all I was doing. I really wasn't paying a whole lot of attention to the game itself. I was just watching Breeze because at that point you knew that the Saints were probably going to lose. And that's when I noticed that Jameis came over and I was like, oh, like, I'd like to ask him about that. And then, of course, you know, we don't get the backup quarterback in Zoom interviews. But again, if we had locker room, like I would have gone up to Jameis and asked him about that moment. Um, and when I asked Jameis about that last week, that just illustrates what Drew means to people. Now, yes, Jameis and Drew had only been teammates for a year, but Jameis was a middle schooler idolizing Drew Brees. Like, again, with the time distortion that we were talking about before we recorded, Jameis, when he was in middle school, got Drew Brees' autograph when Drew was, go, ha, like, had a rehab session with James Andrews in Alabama. You know, before Drew had even made his mark with the Saints, like, Jameis was looking up to this guy. And people kind of forget that, that... You know, Jameis leaned on Drew's advice when he was getting ready to go through the draft process and even picked his brain while they were, you know, rivals. Um, and Drew means a lot to a lot of people, even if they weren't teammates, because Drew always tries to be there for people who want his advice. And that's, I think that's where that emotion from Jameis came from. It's not that they were just teammates for a year. It's that Jameis has idolized him since he basically started playing football. And to be his teammate for a year, the last year, um, I think made that emotion even more powerful because he finally got to see what he does behind the scenes um, in the moments that you know aren't glamorous or sexy. Yeah, definitely. And I actually appreciated it too, just to see the way Jameis reacted because, you know, when the Saints played their final game this past season with the Bucs, even, you know, myself just watching, I was like, I, I know I'm going to shed a tear when the day comes because it's true. You watch him for 15 years, you, 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 you develop so much admiration for his craft, like you were talking about before. So to see Jameis have the same admiration, it definitely is cool. I kind of want to shift gears as a totally different subject, but I noticed it kept you really busy on Friday, but not getting into the specifics because we don't even know the specifics, but obviously the Marshawn Lattimore situation kind of mm -hmm. throws a wrench. Uh, I'm assuming in the negotiation plans with him and stuff like that. But for fans that are asking, because I saw so many people tweeting at me and I didn't get back to all of them, unfortunately, but you were on it with everything in terms of whether he was still um, being held, what happened, all the details, stuff like that. 
what can you just tell fans who are panicking right now about this whole situation? Like, obviously, we don't know the, the full thing because with this specific arrest and what happened with the stolen property, there's so many details as to who had it originally and what went down. But for fans thinking, oh, is this the end of Lattimore's time with the Saints? What would you tell them? Um, I don't I don't think it. No, um, these things take forever. These things take forever to go through the legal system. And then it takes even longer on top of that to go through the NFL's disciplinary system. So remember when PJ Williams got dinged for a DUI right after the Saints lost to the Rams? He didn't get suspended until midway through the following season. So there may be punishment for this. We have to let the legal situation play out and then once that plays out, then it goes through the NFL system. So this could take forever. Like Marshawn, if he is disciplined for this by the NFL, it may not even be this upcoming season. It may be the season after that. That's just the way that it goes. Now um, he was released. So he was arrested on a week ago because today is Thursday. It was last Thursday. Um, and he was bonded out of jail on Saturday afternoon. Um, confirm that with you know him posting a happy birthday post to his mom on Saturday afternoon on Instagram um you know his lawyer said that you know it's all a big misunderstanding and they've just gotta go through the process now um he was officially charged with a a fourth degree felony um because and it's a felony because in the state of Ohio if you are in possession of stolen property um if it is a firearm, regardless of the property's value, that's a felony because it's a weapon. So again, have to go through the process um, with that, but yeah, we will see. But this will, this will take a while. Um, there, will, there won't be any very quick resolution with this. Um, as we all know, the, the legal system takes a while to jump through and you have to get all the way through that before the NFL uh, can start with something. So just be patient. Um, But yeah, it's gonna complicate things in terms of his extension. Well, luckily for the Saints, I guess, they don't have to sign him to anything right now. Um, They can wait until this time next year if they want it. Well, not quite this time next year, but you know, 11 months from now, so. We'll yeah. see what happens. You you talked about being patient. The good thing is we we both know Saints fans are very patient. Obviously, I've, yeah, I've, totally, I've, totally. They're, they're totally impatient, myself included. But even before this Lattimore situation kind of happened, I always thought, and I could be wrong, but I always thought the biggest need for the Saints was the second cornerback on this team because they yep. do lose Janoris Jenkins, and that is a big loss. I think a lot of people kind of undervalued how important he was for this defense last season. For you personally. If you had to rank it, what would be your top need for this team? Is it that second cornerback or are you looking elsewhere? Yeah, it's uh, it's for me, it's 1A and 1B. 1A is figuring out who your starting quarterback is going to be. We we think we know who it's going to be, but like obviously that's important. But 1B is corner, and especially with the Marshawn situation, because if he ends up being suspended for any amount of time, that's both of your starting, starting corners. Like that's – And with the cap situation being what it was, the Saints lost a lot of their depth um, all over the place. And so you're not going to have that luxury of having multiple starting caliber people all over the place. So yeah, that's, that's an important need. Uh, Starting corners don't grow on trees. So it's super important even before any of this happened. Yeah, definitely. And, and Saints fans know that all that well. I mean, with, with Janoris, he was, they kind of got lucky with the way the Giants cut him and then able to they get him. They got so lucky. They yeah. got so lucky. He, at the time that the Saints, or not, the, that the, the Giants put him on waivers, he was the league's leader in interceptions. Yeah. yeah. That never happens. That never happens. I'm surprised, honestly, that he fell to the saints in the waiver order. I'm surprised nobody claimed him in the order or earlier in the order. I'm surprised the saints got him to be completely honest with you. Yeah, absolutely. Was he cut for a kind of gross thing? Yes, but 
that's football. Like, if you're good at football, you will land somewhere. So. Yeah, you're not wrong. And, and, and unfortunately, we've seen people land elsewhere for much worse than what he did. Not saying that what he did wasn't bad because it obviously was, but we've seen much worse. One thing I noticed, and it's, it's almost crazy to me because we kind of knew that the Saints were going to have to cut players. Yet when they did, the reaction from the Huda Nation was still like, oh, my God, I can't believe we cut this guy. And whether it was Morstead or Quan or Emmanuel Sanders or Janoris, like there was a bunch. So if I throw all those names out there for you, and we kind of think Janoris was the most important that they might lose. Who would you say is the second most important guy that they either cut or lost? And I'll throw Trey Hendrickson's name in there. Would you put him there? Who would, who would be the guy for you think they're going to miss the most this upcoming season? Um, Quan, they'll miss a lot just because of the energy that he brings. But honestly, and uh, I might get some weird looks when I say this, but Justin Hardy. They didn't cut him, but he's not here anymore. And he was so valuable on special teams. And as just a person in that locker room, like, yeah, that's, to me, that's who they're going to miss the most. Because he was captain, he wasn't a captain, but he was captain caliber on special teams, right? And yeah, when you just think of the special teams units, you think of Thomas Morstead, obviously, uh, who they will also miss, but we kind of saw that one coming just because it's very expensive. He's one of the highest paid punters in the league, if not the highest paid punter. So with cap casualties and Blake Gilligan um, in the fold, unfortunately, business decisions have to be made. Um, obviously, Will Lutz, Justin Hardy, and JT Gray. And Craig Robertson are the people that come to mind when you think of unsung or you know special teams people, and of course Deontay Harris. I can't I can't forget about him, but that's potentially three guys that aren't going to be back with Thomas Morstead, Justin Hardy, and Craig Robertson. Like he's a free agent; he hasn't been re-signed. He hasn't signed anywhere else yet. But that's it, man. Special teams unit for the saints have been so consistent over the last several years. And that's an area that I'm going to be watching really closely. It's just like, what the heck are they going to do? And are they going to be as good as they were with losing several key pieces from the years before? Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Justin Hardy because the one thing a lot of Saints fans, I remember this past season, they were kind of upset because they could tell Morstead's leg wasn't where it needed to be. Now, he said he was hurt, and, and maybe he'll take that step up with whoever he signs with. But the reason the Saints didn't give up a lot of punt return yardage was because of guys like Justin Hardy. They're just such, such good uh, players at their job. And with him, you always feel like he's going to make the play. I remember when I spoke to him last month, he, he wasn't really sure where he was going to go. I'm almost happy for him that he did land in New York. And I say this as someone who's in New York because it took him one press conference for all my friends who are Jets fans to text me and be like, man, I love this Justin guy. Like it, it took him literally one press conference. That was it. He won people over. Uh, I want to kind of go on the flip side and think of a, a positive life for this Saints team because they're losing a lot of guys. People are going to need to step up and there's a bunch of candidates that we can pick. But if you had one in particular that came to your mind, who would you say is your breakout player or at least someone you would say is a breakout candidate for 2021? Okay, so I'll go offense and defense for this. Offense, Marquez Callaway. We saw pieces of what he could do last season. And whew, with, a, with a hopefully healthy Michael Thomas and Marquez as maybe your wide receiver two slash three, depending on the role that Traquan plays, I'm interested to see what he can do um, when put in favorable positions. Um, I think he's great. The Saints, yet again, found another undrafted gem. I love that. Um, and then defense, uh, Carl Granderson. Yeah, I, I, I think Granderson's that, a popular one. Yeah, he – so last season when Trey was having his breakout – year you know I asked Carl I was like does that give you any hope just looking at what Trey's role was in his first couple of years here uh and now looking at him you know when he's you know he was leading the league in sacks at that time he's like yeah you know like it gives me a lot of hope that you know I can do the same thing 
And so, yeah, he's going to be someone to watch for sure. Um, obviously, we still need to pay attention to Marcus Davenport, but I think Carl plays a bigger role in the rotation. Um, you know, he rotated with Cam and then um, – on the one side and then Marcus and Trey were on the other. So I'm interested to see what happens with the rotation. If Carl flips to the other side or if there's, you know, Cam gets less snaps or whatever they, whatever they do, or they run more NASCAR packages or whatever. But yeah, I think Carl um, is primed to have a really big step up in production this season. This season. Yeah, that, that's been the, the popular pick for Saints fans. I saw there was a workout video of him yesterday that people were kind of sharing on the timeline. So they're hoping that he can take that jump. And someone else who will also join the defensive line, who knows, maybe he gets it going with Ryan Nielsen, someone that you guys spoke to uh, earlier this week, to know Passigno from the Chiefs. Really, yeah, I mean, a lengthy guy. I mean, he has all the potential and the tools. We'll see what happens with New Orleans. But what would you kind of get from him, at least, uh, since you guys spoke to him, I believe, on Tuesday it was? What, what was the feeling of him joining the Saints and, and his type of fit with this team? Yeah, I think, I think it's going to be a good fit. Um, obviously he has to, you know, get with the team and they need to figure out, okay, how do they want to rotate him in that type of stuff? But I, th I think it's going to be good. I, I have no reason to believe otherwise. And I mean, it's a pretty good player for, uh, you know, having the cap issues that the Saints have right now. Right. So that's, it just goes to show that there are a lot of middle tier talent players that, you know, are on the market at a, at a reduced rate. And I think he's going to take advantage of that this year, or at least be in a position to take advantage of that. Yeah. I, I'm almost looking at it as if, and this is my, you know, baseball side of things coming in. Cause I, I, a huge fan of Moneyball and that movie. And I almost wonder if the saints kind of feel like they can, put Granderson and passing you production and kind of for less price, almost replicate what Trey gave them. It's going to be hard to do because Trey was fantastic last year, but if they can get those guys to combine for double digit sacks, I think they'll, they'll be in good shape. Another person you guys spoke to this week, Nick Vanette. The one thing I, I learned from his press conference, just watching it, I would love to know the conversation that he had with Sean Payton. Cause it sounds like those two were sending love letters or something. It was, it was interesting. Uh, what's your take on Nick? I know he's a, he's primarily a blocker, but what'd you get? It seemed like the saints have a plan for him, at least from what he was saying. So before we get into him, I was very surprised that the saints cut ties with Josh Hill. Like I just didn't see that coming. Um, so when they did that, I'm like, okay, well, they're not going to ask Adam Troutman to play every snap. So they're, they're going to need a, a veteran ish guy to be their to be their block, to be their number one blocking tight end. I also did not expect Nick Finette to be on the cutting room floor either. Like I was surprised that the Broncos let him go. So I think it was a smart pickup for the saints, especially just the way that their offense is designed. They, they run a lot of two tight end sets. Um, and yeah, I think, it, I think there's potential there. Um, yeah. He's a good player. Again, I'm kind of surprised that the Broncos let him go, but this year is an anomaly and there's a lot of good players that are, that are being let go. So yeah, I think there's, like I said, with everybody so far, I think there's potential there. Um, just especially with how the Saints use their tight ends. And with Adam Troutman uh, seeing his production last year and being more of a pass catching tight end, he did a lot of blocking stuff too, but let's be real. But he, yeah, sorry. I'm getting caught up in all the, just thinking about FCS football and I haven't even been able to talk to Adam Troutman in person and talk about Dayton and all that stuff. It's fine, we'll get there, we'll get there eventually. We'll get there this year. We'll see you put out a story on Trout, but it's, it's going to be glorious. I, I want to ask you, this is just general, not even Saints, just NFL. It, I wouldn't have asked you on Tuesday had we done it then because I don't think it was confirmed yet, but now we know that the regular season is going to be 17 games. I haven't really talked to a single person who likes it yet because the 16 just looks perfect. What's your take on 17? I, I know it, it is what it is. It, it's going to end up you know, producing more money, and I know the NFL is a business, but what was your take on, on the 17th game? I find it to be 
what's the word I want to use? Mm. The NFL, as it operates, honestly, adding another game with not giving another bye week it's a total farce it's like oh we care about player safety do you do you you want to add another game yeah they're getting paid more money but no other bye week like that's that's what frustrates me is just that they're like oh yeah we care about player safety okay so you're gonna you're going to give you know 50 to 100 more snaps to those players, like, okay. Like, I'm not a huge fan of it um, just because of that. I, I just, I, yeah, like you said, the NFL is a business and it's gonna continue to operate that way. But there are trickle down things as well that Cam Jordan actually tweeted about one of them. I'm like, okay, so how will stat comparisons work then if there's an extra game? Like it was so nice to have all of these same game things from 1978, right? To last season. So you could easily compare things. Obviously the game in 78 was way different than last year, but, or just, are they gonna rest players now? Like, are we going to see some load management type things? Um, you kind of saw that a little bit um, for teams that were, you know, locked into their playoff seeds in either, you know, weeks 15, 16, 17. Um, will we see more of that just to save some energy and, you know, in hopes that your star players don't get hurt? I don't know. Like, there's just a lot that is unknown about how teams will operate with this. Um, maybe it turns out to be a good thing, but I, I'm not optimistic about it right now. Though I will say this, a lot of people were in my mentions about, oh, what about game 18? That's not even on the table until 2032. So we got a while, so don't, yeah, just, just be angry about the 17th game now. Don't be angry about the potential for an 18th game because that's a very long time from now. Yeah, I agree. It, it comes off hypocritical. I'm not surprised because I never, you know, I know it's wrong to say, but I never really think the NFL actually cares about player safety. Like it, they, they do what looks good in the public eye if they have to, like if they need to save face, but they really don't care enough. And it's, the NFL is a marathon, like getting through 16 games is hard enough. Now getting through the 17 games, really tough. And I remember this past season, Saints fans were like struggling to figure out and, and giving their takes on what the team should do for week 17 against the Panthers and what could be a meaningless game. Cause you didn't know cause of the seating and all that and who to sit, who not to sit. And, and it goes to your point. I, I want to see how teams are going to approach this. Like for a guy like Tom Brady, who's going to be 44 in August, does he play all 17 games? Like, I wonder what a team like Tampa Bay does. I have no clue. So I got two more questions for you before I let you go. And, and none are Saints related, actually. I'm going to throw two curveballs at you. All right. The first one, I'm going NCAA tournament related because I saw you were tweeting about your Kansas Jayhawks. Obviously, they got bounced a little early. And then hey. I, had, I had to stop tweeting about my Syracuse, although I didn't go to Syracuse. I actually went to Hofstra, but I grew up from a young age, a Syracuse fan. They just got bounced recently by Houston. So we have our final four set. One, are you interested in the final four teams that we have left? And two, if you are, who are you rooting for to win it all? So I really like watching Baylor, but I don't know if there is any team out there that can stop Gonzaga. I just, I don't think, I don't, they're so good. They're so good. And I remember watching them be amazing. And I think it was the season oper, opener when they beat the crap out of Kansas. Um, I have blocked that out of my memory, but um, yeah, they're good. And I kind of want a team to go perfect. I, I kind of want it. Like, I don't, that doesn't make me a chalk person. I just, it'd be kind of cool. Um, now, as far as the women's side of things, I don't know. I don't know. I want chaos. There's already been chaos, but hmm, I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, I'll say this for, for the women's, if there wasn't, and 
you know, the, I, I guess, unfortunately, and this is an NCAA issue, but I feel like the first round for the men's tournament, everyone's like eyes are glued. And then for women's, it takes like a week for people to get into it. But I was so happy because I saw when UConn was playing Baylor, the timeline on Twitter was going nuts. And that game one was fantastic. Two, we saw Paige go off and she is, the fact that she's a freshman just boggles she's my mind. She's so good. Like it's, so she's so good. But just thinking about the final four for women's basketball makes me kind of sad because the women's final four was supposed to be in New Orleans last year and I would have covered it and I would have covered Sabrina and it would have been great, but it's fine. I'm not mad. I am mad, but it's, it's fine. I love basketball. I'm sorry. No, I don't, I don't blame you. And I, I, actually, the one thing I hated about last year's tournament getting canceled was Sabrina probably was not only was she great, though, but she was one of the, the women who like knew how powerful her platform was. So you were getting people to start watching women's basketball more than they would, which is awesome. And obviously, the relationship she had with Kobe would have been cool to see if she could finish that off. My last question for you, it's actually going to be movie slash TV related. Okay. So obviously, for the last year, People, you know, people are staying at home. They got to do what's safe for them and their families. They need things to watch. And I know me personally, I went through about a hundred and something different movies that I'd never seen before. And ones that I should have though. Like, you know, at one point I didn't see Pulp Fiction. So I knocked it off the list and I would just go through a bunch of classics that I didn't see. And a lot of people, you know, don't worry. I got weird looks for it already. But if you had to pick your three, I'll go three all-time favorite movies if you have and give me one TV show that you're either watching or you've watched over the last year that you think people should check out, hit me up with them. All right. So I, <laughs> oh my God. Uh, so my favorite movie is The Princess Bride. Um, you can judge me. It's fun. <laughs> um, and then my second favorite movie is Fight Club. Again, I, I know I, I am chaotic. It is fine. Um, that says all that I think you need to know about me is that those are my two favorite movies. Um, hmm. So if you haven't seen either one of those movies, I am sorely disappointed in all of you. I, I'm, uh, I'm glad you mentioned Fight Club before you get the TV show real quick, because I actually have on that corner, I have a picture of Fight Club with one of the quotes that I like. And on that corner, I have actually one of those Funko Pops of Tyler Durden. I, I love it. I actually bought the graphic novel for what was supposed to be the sequel. I haven't gotten to it yet. I heard it's not that good anyway, but I'll see when I get to it. But that was actually one of the movies I didn't watch until last year. And then when I did, I watched it like five times. But as I kept watching it, I kept realizing how like I felt so dumb because I should have realized what the plot twist was like immediately. But it, that movie is a classic. Anything with Brad Pitt for me just works. But yeah, those two, those are both great choices. Now give me your TV show if you got one. So I... I've just gone back and rewatched a lot of my favorites. Um, but my favorite show probably of all time would be You're the Worst. Um, it, is, it was on uh, FX, I believe. Um, it's not on air anymore. It was only like five seasons. Um, but it was a show that it is not for everybody, first of all. Um, but it just does a really great job of portraying um, mental illness in like a real way, like, and not, you know, making the characters feel like tropes. Um, yeah, it's about four pretty horrible people um, and uh, how they move through life, um, whether that's with depression or PTSD or being a complete narcissist um yeah it's really good um it's not for everybody but I really liked it um I miss it a lot it was such a good show um and then for something lighter um I just go back and rewatch Futurama like all the time I love that show so much so but again if you haven't seen Futurama like I don't I don't know where you've been like that's living under a rock. So I, I haven't seen your first one. I'm going to put that on my list because I have to check that out. Futurama, obviously I've, I've seen more than enough. Uh, I, I have to actually 
diversify my, my TV portfolio, as people will say, because I tweet so much office stuff. And I think people are getting sick of me just reposting the same memes. Okay. Well now we have, is the office just not for you because it, it, no. it's, it's so too cringy. I can't, I can't do it. Like I can't watch anything that's cringy. So like if there's cringy moments in like TV shows or movies, like I will fast forward through it. Like I just, I can't do it. It makes me feel so uncomfortable. And so that show, I can't do it. I, I can't do it. Like people make fun of me for it. Like, oh, it's such a, it's a huge part of like culture. I'm like, I get the references. Like, because all y'all office fans won't stop talking about it. Of course I know what it means. Like, of course I know where it's from. But like, I just, I can't do it. I've tried like multiple times. I've tried to sit down and watch that show and I can't do it. I don't blame you. I think the one thing about that show, maybe more than others, it's so like 50, 50, either you love it or it's like, no, nah, just keep the office away from me. Cause actually when it comes to my family, I have some cousins who love it. I love it myself, obviously. And I have some people like, I know my parents never, like if I would put it on and they see Michael Scott with one of those cringy moments that happens, they're like, nope, off, off. I can't do so. Yeah. I, I respect it. I don't agree with it necessarily, but I, I definitely respect it. Uh, but anyway, Amy, I appreciate you coming on. Obviously, uh, busy week for the Saints for once. I know people were begging for them to make some moves in free agency. They finally did with the uh, $2 that they have in cap space, but they, they were able to pull off some, some moves there. Uh, for people who aren't already following Amy, go on Twitter at Amy underscore just. Did you hit 10K yet or are we almost there? If not, we got um, to I'm kind of close, not close enough to say that i'm close but um yeah i am at i'm pulling it up right now i'm at 9831 so we're getting there we're getting there um but uh to make one last point i spell my name a little weird so that's amy a-m-i-e underscore just like the word um and to uh give you a rebuttal liking the office is not a personality trait just saying I, I feel like I have just been subbed now. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but yeah, guys, make sure to follow her on Twitter at Amy Just, the way she spelled it, A-M-I-E. Also check out her work on NOLA.com. Great stuff there. And hopefully we'll see some stories in the future on guys like Adam Troutman and other players who you were hinting at before. Uh, but once again, thank you for coming on. And for everyone listening, I'll have a new episode out later this, uh, actually not later this week, only later this week if something crazy happens. If not, Monday, I'll be back on here on the Straight Up Saints podcast. So I appreciate you guys tuning in. Obviously, it was hectic the last two weeks, but I'm back on the solo grind. We're here to stay, and you could tune in to another episode on the Straight Up Saints podcast this upcoming Monday.